<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. The Standing Committee meeting for Monday, October 6th, is now called to order. I believe we're trying to get a hold of uh, Councillor Stryker. He's uh, overseas right now and he was calling in. Do we have any luck? Uh... Your Worship, we're still trying, but no luck so far. Okay. Well, you know, he's trying really hard. Not that he has to, but he's, uh, it's pretty important to him, so he's trying. So, may I please have a, a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda? We do have some delegates, Your Worship. We have Jacqueline Bedard on behalf of Raven Recycling. We have Cameron Eckhart speaking to recycling and Pavlina Sudrich also speaking to recycling. Can I have the last name for the last person, please? Uh, Pavlina Sudrich, S-U-D-R-I-C-H. Thank you very much. All in favor of the agenda as amended, please. Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, there being no proclamations this evening, so I'd like to move right on to the delegations, if I may, please. So our first delegate this evening is Jacqueline Bedard. If she's in, she'd please come on up. And uh, Jacqueline, would you please give your name and uh, address for the record? And you'll have five minutes, so it'll be green. And then it'll go amber for a minute and a half. And uh, I just want Council to know that uh, this young lady actually has done a tremendous amount for skilled trades and technology in the Yukon. She's a, a friend and colleague that worked with me for many years on, uh, at Yukon College. So a bit of a different hat today, but I'm <laughs> delighted you're here. So welcome. And you called me young. Very kind. <laughs> <laughs> the older I get, the younger we get. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, uh, Jacqueline Bedard, my address is 399 Valley View Crescent, Whitehorse. Now, where is this green light? It's, it's we can see it. We'll probably be waving Talk. our arms or something. Gotcha. So it's, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Curtis and Council, for this opportunity to address you this evening. I'm here as president of the board of Raven Recycling Society, and I'm happy to report there are a number of board members in the audience as well. I want to thank you, sorry, I want to speak to you about why we are closing our public drop-off area on October 15th. I also want to talk about the importance of a sustainable waste management system for Whitehorse that includes recycling. Just to be clear, there are many services that Raven will continue offering the public, such as accepting uh, beverage container recycling, education in the schools, our involvement with Zero Waste Yukon, as well as the paper waste or paper save program, to name a few. First, let me commend your council and staff on the work you've done over the past two years on developing and beginning to implement the city's solid waste action plan. We are pleased that you're taking this issue seriously and moving towards 50% diversion by 2015. We recognize that closing our public drop-off will negatively affect your goal. We appreciate, however, your involvement in finding short-term and long-term solutions to the lack of a sustainable waste management system. Nationally, diverting waste through recycling is an integral part of any solid waste management system. Raven, P&M, and the Blue Bin Society can provide valuable services as parts of that system, but these services have to be paid for. There are many pieces to a viable system. We recognize that the city has begun working on some of the pieces that they are responsible for. We also recognize waste costs money. Over the past week, we've heard that people know that waste costs money. We've also heard that people recognize waste is a government responsibility. In Friday's papers, I was heartened to read two votes of support for such a move. John Thompson wrote in his editorial, residents need to realize they pay the cost to recycle waste one way or another. You can do it at the time of purchase as a surcharge, at the time of disposal as a tipping fee, or through the municipal or territorial taxes you pay. And a woman named Marlon Davis wrote in her letter to the editor, also on Friday, I accept that if I want to consume to the level that creates that kind of waste, then I should accept responsibility to pay for it. Some people say that Raven Recycling is looking for a bailout. We're not. We have no interest in a bailout. 
We are a society that is passionate about this issue, managing the waste stream. And this is about a system of managing waste that is not sustainable or adequate. We've been talking earnestly about the need for changes to the system since 2008. Both the City of Whitehorse and Yukon government have participated in or received at least eight reports since 2009. Nobody has taken action because they haven't had to. We had to. We recognize that we could not afford to continue to operate the public drop-off any longer. We made a prudent business decision, a decision based on the fact that although we have the same revenue sources as the other processor, P&M, we recycle the majority of the non-refundables that are kept out of the Whitehorse landfill. We're concerned that material is going to end up in the landfill now. It's time to finally address how we are going to pay for recycling. It's time for the City of Whitehorse and the Government of Yukon to develop and implement a system that encourages people to recycle and supports businesses and nonprofits who do the work. To the public, I ask you to write letters to Yukon Government and the City of Whitehorse asking for governments to implement a viable system for recycling in Yukon, one that pays for the actual costs of recycling and one that you are willing to pay for. To the Mayor and Council and the Government of Yukon, I ask you to get together and solve this issue. You each have many tools at your disposal and it is your job to ensure there's a framework in place that will work for the future. A good place to start is to review the recommendations made in 2012 to the Solid Waste Advisory Committee and implement those recommendations. This plan was developed by representatives from both levels of government, both processors and others. Mr. It's Carter, a well yes. thought out plan. I'm Thank you. you to, to I see the stuff now. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'll give you as much latitude as I was able. Um, Councillors, any questions? Ms. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for your um, input to us tonight, Ms. Bedard. Um, it seems to me you've been at it for quite a number of years now, you and Raven generally. Did you spend time um, researching how it's being done in other jurisdictions or other communities around Canada of a similar size to ours? And is there any lessons learned out there that we can avail ourselves of? Because frankly, um, it seems to me that compost, recycling, these diversion op options aren't discretionary. They, they, they have to be addressed. And why is it that we're now reaching a crisis point here in Whitehorse when frankly, it seems to me that we should be ahead of the game here? Thank you. Uh uh, Kirk and um, I brought Joy with me, our ED Joy Snyder, uh, to help answer questions. You know, it's probably a, a bigger discussion uh, about the research that we have done of other processors, but I'll, I'll um, check in with Joy for a minute. Uh, but I can tell you that um, Joy has mentioned uh, some research they've done with regards to what's happening in NWT, and there is a very strong system in place there. Um, so surely if they can do it, we can learn from what they've done. Do you have anything to add to that, Joy? Yeah, we developed a report uh, with the solid waste, the processors working group on, on different sort of northern and isolated similar um, areas such as ours and their recycling setup and I can send that to you actually. But I think, Christine, you probably have a copy of that. I'm sure we do, Joy. Yeah. Yeah. That's Please. If, if I may, as a, as a follow-up, um, I, and I guess this is more a question to administration, is let's say worst-case scenario and what we see now going to Raven as a, as a part of a recycling program ends up in the landfill, what's that going to do to our landfill in terms of shortening its life, and what does it cost if we were to turn around and have to open up a new pit to take on yet again more uh, materials that really should be going to a recycling program? 
Thanks for the question. I know that our manager, Klahosi, who's not here tonight, um, typically what she discusses is a, the landfill liability that we, that we take on when we, the, the harder it is to close a landfill. So the, more, the fuller it is, the, the sooner that happens, then it, it becomes our responsibility and our liability earlier than what we, we wanted it to be. So it's better when you can stretch out the life of a landfill because you, you reduce your costs over time. And um, so she has a beautiful graph that kind of shows that if we divert, then we extend the life of our landfill, I think up to 50 years. And, and that's at 50% um, uh, diversion. <coughs> so there aren't, does that answer your question? Is it? it uh, generally, I guess I guess I'm looking for some numbers. I'd like I'd like to know oh. what the the cost benefits are of our right. of of the various options that are before us. And I get I guess this is a starting point to maybe just ask that question whether we can start looking at that those hard economic realities. And I, I know we've got some of those numbers, yeah. but it would be nice to do and focus in on what the what the the big picture looks like for us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. We and we can undertake to do that. We are in fact we have already started. We have. Phase one of a report being done right now, completed, and we'll continue on that path. That's the the idea. Yep. Any further questions, comments? Uh, uh, Councillor Gajano first, please. Then Councillor Stockdale. I was just wondering, in regards to corporate clients who pay for a pickup of their cardboard and their paper and stuff like that, is that going to continue? And if it does, will you need to raise rates in order for you to be able to recover the cost of it? Um, yes. One of the tools that the city did put in place was the cardboard, uh, I call it a ban, but it's not a ban. <laughs> and that was the idea of that, that you know, all of a sudden the processors could start, you know, to charge for material that you know, comes through our gates. And it would always be less than the two. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of in place. But, you know, those things take time. We do charge sort of minimal drop-off fees for and we are looking to sort of charge more, but you know the industry takes time to change and adjust to that. But hopefully that happens. Okay. Thank you. Just talk to you, please. Yeah, I, I said before we came in here, we had a little meeting before, and I was just generally feeling really stressed. This is the most stressful thing I've had to sort of face here. Even above Walmart, actually, <laughs> physically, I feel sort of sick that we're at this impasse right now and we can't do anything very quickly. But I just want to let you know, we are hearing you and we are discussing these things and we're trying to work out some kind of a solution. And I, I do agree with you, you need a long-term solution. We can't make any promises, but we are part of the solution to the problem. And I'm sure we will find a solution, but it is frustrating that you can't move and why did we get to this point and it had to, had to take that action. I know I remember I used to go to conference, sports conference, and one guy stood up one day and said, you only see the writing on the wall when your back's to it. And it's been one of my favorite sayings. So that is good. Sincerely, I hope we can come up with a solution in not too long a time, but there may be time before these solutions can be found. Thank you, Councillor Stockdale, and uh, it took seven years to grow this gray hair. I, I understand your stress. Uh, we have felt it for quite a long time, so yeah. Councillor Irwin, please. Uh, Ms. Bedard, you know that the, uh, there are changes to the uh, BCR and EPR. I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Irwin, could you please start with those there, just for our public? I'm, I am yeah. sorry. The, the beverage container regulations and the extended producer regulations. So there are uh, changes possibly in the works uh, by YG. What effect might these have on your decision? If, if there are more uh, materials accepted under these? Our decision is relatively immediate. Those changes we anticipate will take the better part of a year. I see. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and the changes to the BCR don't, you know, the BCR handles about 10% of the product that comes through um, our, our recycling operation. And, you know, sort of changing or raising the fees of 10%. And that stays, you know, that's sort of a, a volume that uh, is pretty static that doesn't grow. There's still 90% of the volume, you know, that we have to pay for. 
And that keeps growing, thank heavens. We want it to. But you know, it keeps growing and changing and morphing. So it's pretty hard to think about BCR funding really um, when you're dealing with the, the recycling of the non recycling. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Gladish, please. Through your worship, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Ms. Bedard for clarifying Raven's uh, situation right now. I think it's good for us all to know that. I'm just wondering if in your messaging you're making it clear to the public that you're not asking for a bailout. This is a much longer term solution that you're looking for. Is that being messaged? It is. We have a letter to the editor uh, coming out this week uh, in both papers, we hope. Uh, and uh, as part of our communication plan, this and that and other pieces, so yes. Thanks, and one other Thank question. You. Please. Um, does the messaging also make it clear that the solutions will be, at, there'll be a cost and that it's up to us as waste producers that we will be paying that cost? Like we have a, basically a cost recovery type of system that's going on now, so this solution that hopefully will happen sooner rather than later will cost everybody something. I believe it does. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, could I give you the chair please? So taken. Thank you very much and, and, and thank you both for coming and uh, as I've, I hope I've articulated this well enough, I can never say it enough. Like, you know, the Mayor and Council and all the citizens of Whitehorse uh, really value our recyclers and I, I use this analogy when someone comes up <coughs> to, to show some disdain. I say this glass is Raven Recycling and this table is the City of Whitehorse. This is a huge issue for all of us. So it's not like we're not trying, we haven't tried. To, uh, to the Deputy Mayor's point, uh, maybe because I'm here full time, but I see this issue being dealt with every single day. We have people that are dedicated to this who are sustainability manager and on. So, um, you know, to suggest that we haven't got the numbers, haven't figured it out yet, that's a big issue. But I think that we can all agree we've worked really, really hard in collaboration with uh, Raven and with other partners as well uh, in composting and cardboard and other things. So it's a big issue that, that I can't tell you how excited I am to actually hear it come out that garbage costs money. We have to pay. Anyone that uses has to pay. And I'm also delighted to see that you're not looking at the short term because, quite frankly, the business plan that exists right now doesn't work. Like we have to fix it. So we get that totally, totally and completely. And everything we do is through the sustainability lens. And you know, we're really proud to have you guys as partners and, and no one's trying to throw you under the bus. And I would hope that you would do the same because you know, I too, kind of like Councillor Stockdale, have lost a lot of sleep over solid waste. I didn't think that solid waste would be my concern <laughs> when, I, when I became the mayor of Whitehorse. But you know, the old adage of, you know, we're replacing a match. We don't burn the garbage anymore. So we do have a continuum. And, and the, the, the sheer volumes that you guys bring in are phenomenal. You can just imagine how much our landfill gets from throughout the Yukon. Mm -hmm. So it's not a white horse concern. It's a Yukon concern. It's a North American concern. And it's one that we have to address through partnership and, and collaboration through all our citizens to recognize that perhaps, just perhaps for the last 22 years that Ravens have been working and P&M and others, maybe we've been getting a free ride. You know, like I know that the pop cans have been subsidizing all the other issues that there's no money for. So we get the business plan is, is flawed, it doesn't work, and it just spells bankruptcy for any organization, nonprofit or otherwise, uh, to succeed. So we're all committed working with you and others to, to address this concern, and we'll just continue to go on because we don't have a choice. We can't just turn the lights out and say we're done. We're going to continue to produce waste. We get that and we understand that. And truly, we cherish your organization and others like yours that that have made a difference, a fundamental change in the way that we act to behave uh, to our environment and to our recycling. So it's an important one, it's a valuable issue, but, but it's not the only issue. We have a lot of other issues when it comes to our solid waste. I'm not saying for a second I'm talking about, about our fire or, 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 or bylaw or anything like that. I'm just talking about solid waste here. The solid waste action plan is the most comprehensive document um, way of doing things within the city of Whitehorse as far as I'm concerned. So a tremendous amount has been done, continues to be done, and it is, it is a relationship that we have to work on with our partners at the Yukon Territorial Government and our recyclers and our public, all our public in general, and our communities. So it's a much bigger issue than just the glass and the table, right? It's a big issue that I really appreciate you both coming by and articulating your views and concerns, and, and I hope that you're going to leave knowing that we're all on board, like we all get it, like this is, you know, this is a bigger problem than a nonprofit organization or one municipality in Yukon. It, it's something that every single person, when they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed, is producing some sort of waste. So we get that, and we, we need to address it. So if I could have a chair back, please. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Chair back to you, sir. Thank you very much. So is there any, any other questions or concerns for our guests? And if not, then I thank you both very, very much for coming by and sharing, sharing with us. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. So our next delegate this evening is Cameron uh, Eckert as uh, a delegate, so if, please feel free to come on up. And the same goes for you, sir. You'll please give your name and your address for the record. You'll have five minutes, and please stick around afterwards. We may have some questions or some, <coughs> some thoughts for you. So thank you. Sure. Okay, my name's Cameron Eckert, and I'm at 1402 Elm Street in Porter Creek. <clears throat> like uh, I've just heard from all the councillors and mayor, I was shocked last week when I heard that uh, Raven was no longer accepting uh, non-refundable recyclable materials. Our family has relied on you know, Raven recycling for 20 years. Incredible service. They've saved us, myself as a taxpayer. You know, I don't know, uh, Councillor Cameron asked the question, how much money? I've heard some tossed out about uh, new cells at the landfill running in the range of $500,000. Raven for 20 years has saved the taxpayers' money. They haven't, they haven't cost us. So as a citizen, you know, I'm coming here with my concerns. Um, Raven has asked, as we've just heard, for a stable long-term funding solution. And I've, I've heard from, I think, all the councillors now that everybody's on board uh, to work towards that stable long-term funding solution. But as someone who takes their recycling to the, to the center every weekend, we also need, I think, a short-term solution. And, um, you know, I've had a, many, many people ask me in the last week or so, you know, are you willing to pay for it? Well, of course I'm willing to pay for it. I mean, they've been saving us so much money for 20 years in landfill fees and waste diversion. Yeah, it's absolutely time we paid for it. As a taxpayer, I'm looking for creative solutions from our government leaders, from the Yukon government, from the city government ways um, and from Raven and the other operators how to how to tackle this question but I really do think we need a short-term solution so that on October 15th and and the, in the weeks after that we're not you know P&M isn't swamped and disabling their operations and the landfill um, you know is overcome you know again by an influx of of goods that can be recycled I'm also concerned about you know the work that's gone on for many years now by many organizations to promote the three R's, you know, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And I'm worried that an interruption to the recycling service in Whitehorse will have a, a negative effect on our interests and our abilities and, and our routine. You know, you go down to the recycling center on a Saturday or even, or even on a Sunday or, or, or during the day, any day of the week. You see people down there, they're kind of nosing in and getting a parking spot, unloading their, unloading their stuff, their recyclables, the refundables. But it's a pretty good atmosphere and it's a real community down there. So, you know, I hear, I've heard from council tonight that, that you get it and I'm very pleased as a, as a citizen to hear that. Um, I'm also looking for a long-term solution, but I'm looking for really prompt action on that. And I'd have to say that uh, despite, you know, Raven not wanting a bailout, I kind of want a bailout. I, I want to be there again next weekend, the weekend <coughs> after. And, uh, you know, personally, I'm going to be looking at ways, you know, to reduce and reuse more. But I think the recycling is, you know, an extremely important part of our family's, uh, you know, management of our, of our consumption and our, our waste as well. So I'd like to just leave it there, and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Stockdale, please. Not really a question, but as a comment, thank you for that comment because that's the thing that's bothering me most is if it does close on the 15th, then what happens at the landfill and what happens around town and that kind of thing. So although governments don't like to do short-term things, or they do a lot of them, and, and there's a sense that they don't want to do a short-term thing, but I agree with what you're saying, that you have to keep the thing open. If you stop a service, it's very hard to, to, to make it grow again, and it can have a detrimental effect to our recycling program. So I, I hear your message. I hope everybody else will hear yeah, your message. Yeah, full in agreement. I mean, I've, I think we've all learned a ton about solid waste management in the last week, reading the incredible letters to the paper. That one by Marlon Davis was, was just spot on. It's time we paid the cost, and I totally understand this is a complicated situation, but I do think in order to avoid a, a crisis, which I think uh, Kirk referred to, I, I do think we have to act quickly to get something in place for the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gladish, please. 
Just, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Eckert, uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. Um, do you think it's realistic to <clears throat> ask people to hold on to their recyclables for a period of time? Like, um, a solution isn't going to happen necessarily in a couple of days. I, I suspect that it could take some time. I am certainly going to be holding on to my recyclables for a period of time. Yeah, I hope I, it's not too long time. <laughs> So I, I think it's realistic. I, I know I, I don't go every week. I, I go maybe once a month or every six weeks and, and tend to stockpile it, and I think a lot of people do. So if we can get the message out, do you think people will hear that and hold on to their recycling? I hope so, and I, I certainly hope they hold on to the, to the incentive and, and the culture of recycling, too, at the same time. Like, you know, my, my son's 19, and these kids have grown up. Uh, with Raven and, and with the whole culture of doing this, doing this work in our community. And uh, yeah, I've always already thought about, um, you know, hanging on to stuff as long as it takes. But we're a family of five in my household right now. Like we're at that peak of using cans, bottles and paper, right? Like we create a glacier of recycling literally every two weeks. So we can, we can certainly try and hold on to it. And I understand that people um, whose kids have moved out or haven't had kids yet, probably more modest in terms of what they're producing, but I, you know, ours is like almost embarrassing how much recycling we're taking down there. I'd like to reduce that, actually. <laughs> thank you. Deputy Mayor Cameron, please. Well, thank you, Your Worship, and, and I, I don't have anything more to say than what I said to Ms. Bedard earlier, but I just really do appreciate that you've come to speak about this. It is a really important matter to our community, and I'm now down to one small bag a month and that's a great thing because everything else goes into compost and recycling, and I don't want that to go away. Thank yeah, it's you. a good feeling. Thanks, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next delegate this evening is uh, Paplin Sidrich. I hope I didn't slaughter your name. If I did, I apologize. Please uh, welcome. The same, same goes for you. Your name and address, please, for the record. And you'll have five minutes. Um, at the end of that five minutes, please stick around. I'm sure we may have some questions for you. I'm nervous. I feel like I'm at court again. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't. Um, my name is Pavlina Sedrich. I live on 803 Wheeler Street. Um, I'm a born and raised Yukoner. Went to school at Jack Holland. Went on a tour of the dump one year. And then the Landfill. Next year, there were, <laughs> and the next Waste year there were bears. Facility. <laughs> right, right. The next year there were bears all over our uh, our elementary school, and I think that was the first time I started to consider that when we throw something in the garbage, it doesn't just disappear. It actually goes in this gross place where bears pick it over and it doesn't exactly degrade. Um, so I heard that Raven Recycling was closing and that was obviously kind of concerning to me. I live with a roommate in a, in a house downtown and we probably produce, well, I think I'm in the same boat as the gentleman who spoke before, quite an embarrassing amount of recycling. <laughs> um, but there's some options out there that I wanted to bring to your guys' attention, which is uh, household recycling, and that's something that has certainly been a successful program in other municipalities in Canada. According to the Government of Canada's Household Environmental Survey, the factors that play a major role in household recycling participation are listed as income, education, and dwelling type. In instances where curbside recycling was offered, the vast majority of participants took advantage of that and recycled, and that actually mitigated the factors such as income and education to recycling participation programs. Um, one of the concerns will obviously be the costs associated with the curbside recycling program, but I think there's a couple different creative ways to address that. One is that recycling can offset two-thirds of household waste, and as you guys mentioned before, the costs associated with relocating uh, and building a new landfill will probably be quite a bit higher in the long run. Um, I think it's also about how you present the issue of curbside recycling. If you start to look at other municipalities who've implemented this program, a creative way that they've worked around the PR of that is instead of charging for curbside recycling, they charge for curbside garbage pickup. Recycling is always free. So it puts a different price on, okay, charge $20 for a bag of garbage, but if you're able to reduce that into a very small package, your recycling is free. Uh, that's certainly something I would be interested in investing more as a, you know, part-time employer employee in the Yukon who works just enough to spend the rest of the time out in the bush. Um, I wrote this list on a piece of paper, which I guess 
this week I'm going to have to either burn or throw in the garbage. <laughs> um, anyway, I guess what I'm encouraging the City of Whitehorse to do is look into fast-tracking a curbside recycling program. I know certainly your uh, organic waste program met a bit of resistance at first, but I think the Yukon also met a lot of resistance when they tried to implement seatbelt legislation. I don't hear a lot of people complaining about that anymore. Uh, I think if you follow a three-tiered approach, make it convenient and accessible for residents, have a policy and legislation in place to charge people for garbage or whatever creative way you guys work to spin it, and then work to educate and promote the program amongst Yukoners. I think uh, at the very least residents of Whitehorse should be amenable to that. Oh. Thank you. Does anyone have any, any comments, questions? Uh, Councillor Gladish, please. Thank you. Since I've personally known Ms. Sedrich since she was born, I'd like to congratulate her for coming here and speaking to us and being so clear and uh, concise. Um, I think you had some great ideas there and uh, thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Any further questions? No, then I thank you very much for, for coming and seeing us today. So we have, we have one last delegate, but he's not really gonna speak today. And actually this delegate, it's a little bit confusing because he actually goes by three names. <laughs> He goes by Brad Firth, he goes by Buddy, and he goes by Car Caribou Legs. So those that, that don't know, uh, Brad or Buddy or Caribou Legs has traveled 8,000 kilometers in the last year, and he's planning on spending the next two months going over throughout our high schools in Whitehorse, possibly elementary schools, and, and talking about his journey and just uh, talking about self-worth and value. And uh, I know that he's not from Whitehorse, but he does have family living in Whitehorse, and is home for the next couple months. And council has asked me, we give, we give this to, to a lot of delegates, a lot of uh, consul generals and people from across the world that come by. And we just want to want to say thank you for, actually I should read what I wrote in because it's a little <laughs> bit easier. But uh, uh, to, to you, just thank you for inspiring so many of our youth, our citizens and our mayor. We're really touched by what you've done. So please come up, I want to give you this book. <laughs> You, you may have noticed I had to run after him when uh, <laughs> I don't think he can sit, sit for very long. But uh, how's that feel, Your Worship? I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, but I know that he's doing pretty good. No, but he is he is truly an inspiration for all of us, and especially for our youth. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from many of our youth and how they've been touched by his uh, his amazing uh, his amazing journey. My understanding is he's going to start from Vancouver and then run to Ottawa. Listen to me, it's like he's running around the block, but he runs like 70 and 100 kilometers a day. And I've got to know him a little bit, and um, his, big, his big issue is just to, to, to talk to youth and, and make a difference in their lives. So he's, you know, I, I know he's only visiting, but he's obviously welcome in our city anytime. <laughs> he's a great guy. So I'd like to, if I may, move on to our standing committees. Um, Councillor Gladish, would you please take your committee for the city planning, please? Thanks, Your Worship. Um, there are two items um, for the City Planning Committee agenda. First item is a report on public input into conditional use for Three Glacier Road in McRae, and I see Mr. Campbell is coming forward to speak to us. So, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Ben Campbell. I'm with the uh, Planning and Building Services Department. So tonight I'm gonna present the uh, public input report for the conditional use application on uh, Three Glacier Road in McRae, which is to permit a 20 uh, seat uh, eating and drinking establishment in the uh, service industrial zone. Uh, so in September, the applicants applied for conditional use approval to, per to per permit an eating and drinking establishment with an apportion <coughs> of an existing multi-unit building at Three Glacier Road. 
also proposed is an off-sales component accessory to the eating and drinking establishment, which is uh, already a permitted secondary use within that zone. So conditional use applications are brought forward to council who either approve, not approve, or approve with conditions the proposal based on, on its individual merits. So the application was introduced to the standing committee meeting on September 22nd and a public input session was held on September 29th. As required by the zoning bylaw, notification letters were sent out to property owners within a one kilometer radius. Uh, the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, Tong Kwachan Council and Yukon Government Land Client Services were also notified by mail. Uh, finally, an advertisement was also placed in the September 19th and 22nd, uh, 26th newspapers. No written submissions were received and no one appeared to speak at the public input session. So the alternatives are, option one is to approve the conditional use application, option two is to not approve the conditional use application. So briefly I'll just go through the analysis section. Um, this was presented at the September 22nd meeting as well. Um, so with regards to the official community plan, the property is located within the industrial land use designation whose purpose is to provide both light and heavy industrial uses subject to proper zoning. While eating and drinking establishments are not directly mentioned as a supportive use within the designation, existing land uses within McRae include a combination of industrial, light industrial, and mixed industrial commercial uses. This includes general contractor services, uh, custom manufacturing, and outdoor storage, just to name a few. Uh, so the official community plan is really meant to be a broad, high-level document. And the presence of eating and drinking establishments in the zoning itself conf confirms that it is contemplated. So the presence of an eating and drinking establishment can be an important service uh, to a significant workforce that is employed in the McRae subdivision. In addition, it has the potential to provide secondary uh, service to a number of um, uh, country residential uh, subdivisions within the southern um, portion of the, of the city, which includes Whitehorse Copper, Wolf Creek, Pine Ridge, Mary Lake, and Cowley Creek. With regards to the zoning, um, the eating and drinking establishments are a conditional use within the zone, so um, which can be approved by council following a public input session. Conditions for approval may be set by council as deemed necessary. Uh, so the current land use on the subject property includes indoor participant recreation services, uh, custom indoor manufacturing, uh, general contractor services, as well as a, a caretaker residence on the property. Um, as mentioned during the September 22nd Sandy Committee meeting, the development also requires a new on-site sewage disposal system dedicated to the restaurant use, uh, which requires an application and permit from Yukon Government Environmental Health Services. Um, and staff has contacted Environmental Services uh, just for a quick update on the status of this permit and it appears that the applicant is uh, well on its way um, to um, proceeding with the application. So the administrative recommendation is that Council approve the conditional use application to permit a 20 seat eating and drinking establishment at Three Glacier Road in the McRae Industrial Subdivision. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Campbell. Uh, any questions from the Council? Uh, Councillor Cameron? I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and two questions of clarity on process. The first is, uh, it says here in the history that the Re Development Review Committee discussed this matter on September 3rd, uh, but the application didn't come forward until September 12th. What were they looking at prior to the actual application coming forward? I can respond to that, Ben. I sure. just, I think it's just the the clarity there is that the uh, Mr. Chair, the application comes in the door of the planning department first, so we're getting first crack at it, looking at it, and reviewing it essentially for completeness. Um, once deemed complete, then we start down the the formal um, process of the notifications and bringing it forward for council. So c call it a pre-screening, for lack of a better word. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And the second question on process is under the analysis that says that applications, council shall consider applications and provide advice on conformance with bylaw requirements. If there are bylaws, who are we providing advice to if it's not to ourselves? I'm not sure I understand what that refers to. M Mr. Chair, I believe the advice is uh, to, to mayor and council, is that correct? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, again, Pat Ross, 
Acting Director, Development Services. I should say that I guess, before I talk. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it is. It is uh, advice provided. Um, you know, in in the case where we be looking at uh, conditions to try to maybe fine tune this, um, we be basically looking at the specific context and place of this application, and maybe making uh, recommendations on how it could better fit within an area. Uh, simplest solution is sometimes we have a conditional use for something like a daycare in a residential neighborhood. We might provide a recommendation for a fence or a vegetative buffer to be installed as part of um, that development going in to help mitigate it uh, with the neighborhood. So that's the type of thing we'd be looking in. In this case, we don't have any conditions recommended with the approval. So Mr. Chair, if I may, so this is an administration providing advice to council, not council providing advice to council. Is that fair to say? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Basically, you'd be adopting our recommendations and then adding any new ones if you saw fit. Okay. That's not what I read here, but that, now I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stockdale. Yeah. I just wanted to, uh, we just um, approved a conditional use for another restaurant in that area, an 80 seat restaurant. What's the status of that right now? Has it gone ahead or do you know anything about that? Uh, Mr. Chair, as far as I know, the that application was brought forward in 2013, and it uh, it was approved um, by by City Council at that time. Um, I I'm unfamiliar whether how the status of of that operation, if it's if it's in operation right now, um, but it was approved and a development permit was issued as part of that application. Okay, I don't know if you dealt with both applications, this one and the 80 seat one. I just wonder if there was any talk. Not that we can tell them the business won't succeed if they go ahead and there's another restaurant a block away. No, that's not our job. But was there any talk at all of, of the other restaurant when this application came forward? Were they aware that someone else had got a similar request in that was approved? Uh, Mr. Chair, is with that regard to the original? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so the... I, I, the, I assume that the applicants would have been made aware with the approval last year that they would have been uh, made aware that there was a, another application in. Um, and that probably came out during the, the screening process with the Development Review Committee. I'm sure the applicant would have been involved and, and would have heard that information. And just a, a further question, which you might not know the answer to because I don't. I just wondered, the hours of operation of, of liquor outlets I'm not sure. Can they can they stagger those hours, or are the hours that are set a certain time? But can they stagger them? What I'm trying to get at here is, if you have a off sales out of town there, if they stayed open really late, it could create some problems in an area like that. But I'm not sure if they're compelled by uh, the liquor corp to set their hours so they control that kind of thing happening. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I do know that they would be required to obtain a, a, a specific liquor license. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with the, the hours of operation, but they would be required to go through a separate process through okay. the uh, Liquor Corporation. I see the city manager nodding her head. Maybe she knows something we should know. I don't think it's the city manager's job to know the Liquor Corporation rules. I think that's a <laughs> territorial issue. Does it no. want to add to that? <laughs> I would just concur with Ben that it is a it's a government of Yukon process. It's the legislation that guides the liquor corp with respect to issuing licenses. So they would have their own rules, and I'm sure they would contemplate exactly what you've contemplated. Okay, thank you, Councillor Curtanu. Yeah, I was just wondering. There's uh, quite a mixture of different uses within the same property. So I was wondering if administration um, can see any potential conflicts in those uses. Mr. Chair, so uh, I guess currently there is um, a caretaker residence um, associated with that property. There's um, a, a dog obedience school. Um, so uh, actually, I, I would think that there would be some um, some overlap and some complement. Um, uh, it would be a, a very good uh, service to the employees that would be working there. Uh, the caretaker um, residence is, is, uh, is supposed to be a, a sort of a associated with the principal use on that building so there wouldn't be 
any they would be made aware that there there's expectation to have other uses uh, so, and um, and active uses associated with that building so um, really it's uh, you know if it's allowed within that lot um, it's, there's a there's a potential for it to really complement a lot of other uses and, and activities in that building so I guess I don't really foresee too many um, uh, conflicts there would be requirements around hours, hours of operation and there's as well as maintenance bylaw requirements around noise and, and stuff yeah thank you thanks any other questions from council hearing none we'll uh, thank you mr campbell we'll move on to new business is there any new business for the planning committee okay is there anybody who wishes to speak to the planning committee Hearing none, I will pass the chair to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Gladish. Councillor Gutanya, would you please take the chair for your City Operations Committee, please? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the City Operations Committee has one, two, three items on the agenda this evening. The first one is compost operations that Mr. Alvester will be presenting. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Dave Albasser, Manager of Water and Waste Operations at the City. Um, I'm, I'd like to present the administrative report for the compost operations in order to provide ongoing compost operations at the waste management facility. The uh, City's compost operations has been ongoing for about 12 years now. We've gone through one major expansion in uh, 2009 when we expanded due to the citywide CART program. Uh, we are undergoing a, another expansion right at the moment to be able to handle upwards of about 4,000 tons when the uh, ICI sector begins to sort their organics as well. The compost facility operations were initially contracted to Raven Recycling in 2002 and the city took over the operations in 2008 as a result of operational difficulties and uh, as well the Citywide CART program, of course, was projecting increased volumes. In May 2012, the, the facility operations were sole sourced to Garrett Gillespie of uh, Boreal Composting under a, an operating services agreement. This agreement expired in May of this year and was sub, uh, subsequently extended to the end of October of this year. During the past 28 months, Boreal has produced between 2,100 and 2,400 tons per year of raw He's processed that into uh, a finished compost. Oriole's composting process has been certified to meet organic standards at uh, the Center for Systems Integration. And earlier this year, uh, Boreal Composting has indicated that the current operating uh, agreement fee of $195,000 per year is inadequate to cover expenses. And any extension of that contract would require a fee increase. With Council's support, uh, in order to ensure an open and transparent approach to the contract <coughs> award, a public tender was issued in September, on September 5th. That tender closed September 18th and only one bid was received. That sole bid was submitted by Adorno Landscaping with Garrett Gillespie as the facility manager for approximately $312,000 in 1415, 357000 in 1516, and uh, going up to 375,000 in 1617. So the al alternatives are to award the contract to the sole bidder and amend the operating budget accordingly, <coughs> or to cancel the tender and direct administration to prepare a budget submission through the normal budget process for city staff to resume operations at the facility. We've undergone an analysis and uh, due to the limited numbers of contractors that are qualified and interested in operating the facility, we don't believe a retender would uh, be of any benefit. And uh, as you see in front of you, uh, the table shows estimates that we've prepared uh, for the city to resume operations at the facility in, in contrast with uh, the uh, bid that we received. So uh, administration has also reviewed the requirements of organic certification at the land uh, at the uh, compost facility and an estimate has been included that would uh, allow the city to retain that certification. Um, this certification is beneficial in maintaining public confidence in the quality of compost produced at this facility 
However, questions on whether to include that uh, organic standard will be brought forward during the uh, operational budget process. Going through the table, you can see that uh, in 2014, our budget for the facility is approximately $220,500. In 2015, we're projecting that cost to go to about $257,000 under a, a city operation if we went that route. Or with the organic standard maintained, that cost would go up to about $276,000. This contrasts with the, uh, uh, the tender bid prices in 2014-15 of a contract cost of about $346,000. In 1516, going up to $391,000 thousand dollars and sixteen seventeen about four hundred and nine thousand I would like to just point out that uh, the compo sales revenue under the contract are significantly lower you can see that um, because under the contract we contemplate 75% uh, of the compost going to the contractor and the city retaining about 25% for our own use under a city of white horse operation of course we would uh, uh, retain all the compost that's produced from the facility so the administrative recommendation is that council direct that the tender for the 2014 to 17 compost facility operations be canceled and that council direct administration to prepare a budget submission through the normal operational budget process for assuming compost facility operations within the city. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Councillor Gladish. Thank you. That's for the chair. Mr. Alvisor, are there any obvious reasons to you why the difference is so large between the, the bid and the city estimate of the, the cost it would cost us to do the operation? I would only be guessing, uh, Madam Chair, but um, the, uh, the facility expenses have, of course, increased somewhat as we have added equipment to the process. Uh, we are improving the uh, the processes, um, as can be seen uh, uh, to the recent um, uh, organic certification that uh, Boreal was able to maintain. That does require quite a bit of work, and uh, we are essentially ensuring that the uh, the compost is is uh, managed better. So costs do increase and, and reflect that uh, somewhat. However. Um, it is a, a significantly over budget, so that I, I really can't speak to. It's uh, it's a, quite a bit higher than we expected. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and related on the money side, the three hundred and twelve thousand dollars that is being proposed for that first year, um, would that be uh, net the amount of? Uh, sorry. Would that be inclusive of the amount of money that they would get uh, from their 75% of the compost that they are able to sell themselves? Like, like it, it seems high in the first instance, as as um, Councillor Gladish says, but in addition to which they're making money, 75% on top of the compost that they're using. So how does that factor into the fact that this is increased by a third, and on top of that, they're making some significant coin I would think from the compost that they're selling uh, am I missing something there uh, through you madam chair um, I, I uh, agree it is uh, it, it is a bit of a jump uh, if you uh, go through the table that uh, I've, I've shown there I do deduct an amount for compost sales and uh, that that revenue is the 25 percent that the city would get back and the 75 percent is entirely the contractors so i'm assuming they would have taken that into account and uh, priced it accordingly um, i did go through the uh, the contract with the the bidder and uh, identified those those uh, those parameters and and uh, sort of went through the uh, the contract in detail to show them what would happen and uh, they they fully understood that so I can only guess um, why uh, why the bid was much higher than we anticipated. Go ahead, please. And a second uh, quick question, Madam Chair. Uh, just the difference between the cost, if we were to take it over, of the City of Whitehurst operating without the certification to maintain our organic standard, what does the consultant do that costs $19,000 a year to give us that accreditation? That seems fairly excessive. 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the the process is quite involved. There's uh, quite a bit of re record keeping uh, and soil sampling. The the sampling itself is uh, is quite onerous. Every lot has to be tested, uh, not only for metals and pathogens, but things uh, uh, like um, uh, nutrient quantities and uh, other other. Um, Parameters that essentially show that the the compost would be good for your garden and uh, and is beneficial. Um, there there are quite a, uh, a number of processes that need to be documented, mm -hmm. and uh, you would adjust your process as required as uh, as you're uh, pr processing this uh, the compost. So it is quite an involved process, and the at the end of the year you end up with a book that you've produced. Uh, the the compost through and documented all those steps. So it is quite quite expensive, and the sampling is is of course very expensive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stockdale. Yeah, I have just a comment in there. I've got about three questions, if that's okay. Um, I'm really disappointed that this hasn't uh, come to fruition, because when we first entered into this agreement, it sounded like a really good deal for us, but. Uh, Obviously, it hasn't worked out. I just wanted: do we have the capacity to to take on this product, uh, this work, and, and do it satisfactorily? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I believe we have uh, the resources adequately uh, set up in the, the um, analysis. Um, the staffing complement would include one uh, sort of facility supervisor and and two uh, staff under that person um, so we're expecting that the bulk of the work would be done at the compost facility and uh, minimal supervision would have to be uh, would have to be uh, um, applied to the the process if we get the, the right staff uh, the the process does include that consulting uh, amount that we would call somebody in if required and when required so we we do allow uh, a bit there for for that help because it is a relatively new process although we've been doing it for quite a while the uh, in order to maintain the standard that we've reached I think we will need a bit of help with that yes and uh, that's what that budgets for just a, another question from that it's have people have the city staff been helping with the project right now have they been working in that area or uh, through madam chair the um, the process is pretty much handled by Garrett Gillespie up at the facility however uh, we do on staff have a uh, a qualified operator who has taken the uh, the solid waste association of North America's composting uh, process uh, uh, course and exam and uh, through his experience and, as I say, the, uh, the assistance of a qualified consultant, I believe we could do this, yes. Okay. I, I remember when we first went into this and then we got a little way along, the along with the project, Mr. Gillespie came to us and said he wanted to do some experimenting in there and try to produce a certain kind of compost. And he would have the rights to this compost, which kind of... You know, I thought, well, he's using our equipment and using our money, and he's producing something that he's going to, you know, um, give get a patent for, and then make some profit from it after he'd finished with us. And I was sort of upset about that. I just wondered, is is there has there been any talk about that? Is there any any liens against us that he has developed this and it's his own uh, um, compost that he's 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 done and developed? On his own, using our equipment, is there anything? No liens against us for that? Uh, I can only speak to uh, what I'm, I believe that you're referring to is the uh, plastic removal system that uh, Boreal is is working on. The process itself is is not uh, patented or owned by Boreal in any fashion, uh, but the machine that he is, has developed, uh, he has developed on his own time outside the the contract. Uh, it has been tested on our compost, and uh, I don't know whether that machine is finished or not. Um, but he has uh, completed that uh, that mm. I guess construction of the uh, that piece of equipment outside the uh, the contract. And you won't need that for your operation. We are producing uh, compost without that machine now. 
and uh, we believe that it's uh, it's adequate the way it is. Um, it produces a better quality of compost by m more efficiently removing plastics out of the uh, the feedstock. Uh, however, we believe we can continue without it. There, there isn't a machine like that on the market at the moment that's available, and most uh, municipalities and compost producers are producing without that machine or, or that technology. So, thank you. That's all. Thanks. Okay. And Councillor Irwin. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. It, it says that city operations do not include outside sales and marketing. So if uh, Boreal composting is out of the picture and the city takes this over, do we go into sales and marketing? That's something that uh, we have discussed, but at the moment uh, we just plan on selling the compost through the gatehouse as we did uh, prior to awarding the contract. And uh, the, the actual sales and marketing uh, process outside uh, the city, uh, we, we do not have staff for. Um, we would essentially uh, provide through the, uh, through the budget um, process if we did want to go through a large scale advertising campaign or anything like that, we would have to identify that separately and, uh, and carry out that campaign separately. Well, it, just, it, it seems to me that we would be competing with private businesses and, and uh, you know, I, I can't quite see this as cost recovery. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that if we actually were to consider doing advertising, and marketing that we would in effect be setting up a business and it, it, it I don't understand how that would work it's three madam chair the uh, the sales and marketing um, would only if if we did contemplate that it would only be to uh, something like uh, Canadian Tire as uh, Boreal Compost is doing now um, and I don't believe there's any other compost being produced in the city so we would only, uh, if we did, go into marketing, uh, specifically address compost. Um, however, we haven't, we haven't really contemplated that under the proposed uh, uh, budget that you see outlined in front of you. So mm -hmm. we aren't going down that way. However, if council decided that we would uh, want to go down that route and start promoting it, we could, uh, we could look at that. I see it. It would be our own development corporation kind of thing. Perfect. Yes, uh, I. Uh, no, thank you very much, Mr. Sure Elvis. Understand the question, <laughs> Mayor Curtis. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Chair. Through you, Madam Chair, I just want to point out the compost facility operations has been a tremendous success. In my in my personal opinion, being up being up there quite a bit, seeing the amount of resource that was given through the federal government through gas tax and Bill Canada, and regardless who does it, if it's going to be a contractor or if it's going to be the city of Whitehorse, I think. Uh, the service that we're providing for our citizens and multi-residential and, and commercial that we didn't have before, that this council, I think, was told would probably never happen. But the work that's being done, it has happened, and it is creating a product that can be used, and it's very sustainable, and it's uh, it's recycling, in an essence, through the, the compost. So I heard a couple comments that I just wanted to kind of correct a little bit, and I'd like through you, Madam Chair, to see if that is accurate, that, that it has been a success, and it has had a tremendous amount of resource put into that uh, to, to, you know, to ensure that more doesn't go into the landfill. So, through you, Madam Chair. Mr. Robison. Yes, um, through you, Madam Chair, absolutely. The, uh, the compost facility has been uh, a success. We are very happy that we've been able to divert the amount of organics uh, between, as I said, uh, 2,100 to 2,400 tons of organics have been processed by that facility. One of the main benefits of that is, is really keeping the uh, organics out of the landfill so that over time we aren't producing leachate. That's, uh, that's a huge benefit and uh, we, uh, because we run a natural attenuation landfill, essentially that means that we are relying on the, the soil to actually treat any leachate that uh, leaves the facility. We, we really need to manage that leachate and minimize it. So this, uh, this program has helped in that respect. Uh, it also helps to reduce the amount of methane gas that's produced. By landfilling organics, uh, it decomposes anaerobically, which produces methane gas, and that can be very problematic. Uh, the city of Yellowknife actually recently received um, a feedback that they couldn't close a section of their landfill due to methane gas production problems. So 
it can be a big issue and this this project uh, and program has uh, through gas tax and, and build Canada uh, and FCM's green municipal fund has been very successful in in helping us meet those environmental goals thank you any other questions or comments council okay thank you mr. officer the next item of business is a contract award supply of janitorial services mr. Muir thank you Evening, Mayor and Council. Dave Muir, Manager of Operations. I prepared a report tonight for your consideration with respect to the award of contract for janitorial services in a number of city buildings. Janitorial services for City Hall, Municipal Service Building, Transit, Public Safety Building, the Old Fire Hall, Warehouse, and some selected pump houses and lift station are provided through a year, three year contract. Uh, currently, there are three separate contracts that uh, cover these facilities. Public tenders were advertised, oh, and sorry, the, the uh, current uh, uh, contracts are set to expire October 31st this year. Public tenders for the, uh, uh, were advertised on August 29th in the newspapers and, uh, and the website with a closing date of September 26th. As I mentioned, uh, the, the current uh, services provided under three uh, separate contracts, we've combined all these contracts uh, to gain better efficiencies in the way our facilities are cleaned uh, and hopefully gain some uh, better pricing. Uh, the new, a new component was added uh, to the specifications to support our zero waste. Uh, the intention of this component is to exhibit leadership in zero waste through recycling, composting, uh, and uh, source separation. Four bids were received. Uh, the first bid was from 40859 Yukon Inc. Uh, for a total uh, cost of 233980 uh, Philcon Janitorial Services for a total of 222,000. MPM De Leon uh, Janitorial Services for 215,376. And Triomni uh, Property Management for $210,007. The alternatives before you tonight are to award the contract to the low bid or cancel the tender. The purpose of this uh, contract is to set out the standards uh, and service levels required to maintain uh, the different city facilities uh, in a manner that provides a safe and hygienic and aesthetically pleasing work environment. The contract also aligns the support for the zero waste goals and provides for clean environmental, clean environmental practices in terms of the delivery of service and hand, handling of materials. Awarding this contract to try on me uh, incorporated the low bidder will provide the city with the services required um, to maintain a variety of different facilities in accordance with the established standards. The administrative recommendation before you tonight is that Council award the contract for the supply and delivery of janitorial services, including waste management, recycling and compost services to Triomni Incorporated for a net annual cost of $210,007 for a three-year term uh, starting from November 1st, 2014, ending in October 31st, 2017. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Councillor Stockdale. Yeah. Did we save some money combining all three contracts? We did, actually. Well, we, we didn't cost us any more money. In fact, the, the lowest bid came in with, within pennies of what we're paying now. So, okay. Thank Council, you. Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just, the compost services kind of stands out uh, to my way of thinking. If we're doing the compost services for the rest of the city, why wouldn't we just pick up our own compost and deliver it to the landfill? I, I'm not sure I understand why we would contract that out. Madam Chair, that is, that is what we would be doing. Um, the zero waste initiative actually talks about source separation. So currently right now, everything just kind of goes into uh, one bin. Uh, we do have some areas stationed set up throughout to some sections of the building, in particular lunch rooms and things like that. But this would now see all areas of the city facilities set up with uh, separation centers. So the uh, idea here is that the janitorial contractor would simply uh, collect that in the separate waste streams and deposit it in the separate waste stream bin in the back, we would pick that up and, and uh, transport that to the landfill. Okay, now it's clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Gladish. Thank you, uh, through the Chair. Mr. Muir, I uh, just want to make sure that uh, <coughs> when the uh, tenders are made that all the businesses have to maintain the same standard, so it's you're not getting a lower standard of the zero waste initiative with a lower bid that they're all obligated to follow the same standards for zero waste 
Uh, Madam Chair, that is correct. In fact, uh, within the uh, specifications of the contract, there are expectations. So the expectations are clearly defined and must be met. If they are not met, then we, we revert back to our um, ability to cancel any contract if they're not meeting uh, the standards. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Okay, last item of business is new business. Do we have any new business for this committee this evening? Okay, and do we have anyone in the gallery who wishes to speak to this committee? Okay, and with that, the chair is back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Gertani. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cameron, would you please take your chair for your Community Services Committee, please? Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we have three items before us tonight. The first is the Whitehorse Trail and Greenways Committee Terms of Reference Revisions. And I think that's probably going to be pretty fast because they're pretty minor amendments. And I believe Mr. Nichuk wishes to uh, speak to those uh, tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Douglas Nichuk, Outreach and Events. Uh, so this evening I will be bringing forward the recommended changes to the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee Terms of Reference. So in accordance with the terms of reference in section 7.0, the Trails and Greenways Committee will undertake a review of the terms of reference by October 31st, 2014. This is an annual uh, thing that happens. At which point the terms of reference recommendations will be presented to City Council to determine if the Trails and Greenways Committee shall be renewed under an amended terms of reference. So this committee meets on a regular basis to discuss and make recommendations based on the trail plans guiding principles, in particular focus on stewardship, public education and respectful use of Whitehorse trails. The alternatives that you have this evening are to adopt the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee revised terms of reference, request that administration do additional work on the terms of reference, or do not adopt the changes to the existing terms of reference. So the committee members of the Trails and Greenways Committee met on September the 18th, 2014 to review and discuss the content of the existing terms of reference and make recommended changes to improve the terms of reference for the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee and its effective operation. So I'd like to quickly just go through some of the highlights then, the highlighted uh, amendments. You'll note on uh, point 7.0 review, there was a grammatical uh, <coughs> housekeeping item that we wanted to deal with. The uh, committee then discussed in 8.0 uh, uh, some discussion around the chairperson position and whether that ought to be rotating or whether that ought to be uh, continue to be uh, the responsibility of the supervisor of outreach and events. Uh, the conclusion was that uh, the committee wanted to have a separate point, number four, the appointment of the committee chair shall be reviewed along with the other terms of reference uh, recommended annually by October 31st. This was reviewed by the committee members at the meeting in September, and it was uh, unanimous, that, uh, almost unanimous, that uh, the uh, chairperson's position should remain with the supervisor of outreach and events for now, with one uh, uh, thought that the uh, uh, supervisor of outreach event and events as the chairperson could uh, div uh, divulge the responsibility of the of the chair to any of the members who might be willing. There weren't uh, many that were willing to take on that responsibility on a more permanent basis. Then uh, further on in the, uh, in the uh, terms of reference, there was uh, under 11.0, 11.9, so it's 11.0 memberships general, and then number nine, the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee shall hold its regular meetings a minimum, and the, the recommended change was to go from uh, a minimum of one time per month to, uh, I'm sorry, meeting a minimum of one time per month to 10 times per calendar year. So uh, recognizing that there are uh, some difficulties in uh, bringing a quorum together during the summer months and during holiday times, and therefore uh, it was recommended to reduce from 12 to 10 the number of uh, uh, meetings uh, required for the calendar year. And then uh, just a little bit further down on point 12 of that same uh, area, the White Horse Trails and Greenways shall uh, attempt to achieve consensus where consensus is not possible. So there was uh, just an addition of a uh, housekeeping item there. 
And then under 11.3, communication with the Trails and Greenways Committee activities, there was a fair amount of discussion in point number one about the um, meetings being conducted in public. Uh, with the opportunity to be able to go in camera and uh, there was an awful lot of discussion as you recall uh, earlier this year about that and uh, and uh, subsequently the uh, committee has recommended that council rescind the ban on uh, on uh, uh, observers and uh, they'd like to open uh, the meetings back up to the public for uh, for observer status uh, but would like to still have the opportunity to go in camera uh, when appropriate and I believe those were the recommended amendments to the terms of reference. Thank you, Mr. Nichuk. Uh, anybody have questions or comments? Councillor Stockdale. Yeah, I was just curious with um, number four and number three. It seems a little con confusing or contradictory. If you're a permanent member, but they're going to review your membership a year later, then you're really not a permanent member. You're the chair for one year. That not confusing right so there was some discussion about that uh, so there's two parts to point number three uh, mr. chair uh, the supervisor of outreach and events shall be a permanent member of the committee so that's one point and then also also shall act as the chairperson and that was what the committee had uh, recommended <coughs> continue for uh, this upcoming uh, year with the uh, consideration in point number four that annually it could be reviewed and could change so point number three could change in an amended terms of reference say brought forward in 2015 should the committee decide that they'd like to rotate the chair or do the chair uh, responsibility in some other fashion would would that city chairperson would it be a city person that would be the chair uh, or mr. Could chair, it be a member of the committee mr. chair not necessarily uh, that chairperson could uh, uh, be one of the committee members if I might through the chair one more question number eight on the makeup of the membership of the committee uh, there are no sort of uh, Councilor Stockdale so that's 11 membership general number eight under that is that where you are uh, eight under composition membership eight number eight eight point eight I believe mr. chair eight point eight okay yeah, thank the you committee it says what the makeup of the committee is but there's no independent voices in there somebody's got a bias in there from an organization and I just wondered if uh, 9.2 was the reason why you didn't have an independent person on there because there's an opportunity for people to present points in front of the committee does that cover that situation off uh, mr. chair the uh, direction that uh, that administration received from council was that members of and it's uh, uh, identified in the terms of reference are that uh, members of the committee shall be made up of representatives of stakeholder uh, groups and organizations and community associations that are all registered with societies and in good standing with societies however uh, if a uh, individual wish to speak to the committee they're able to do so individually as a representative okay. thank you that's all thank you uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gladish. Thanks. Uh, uh, just to further to Mr. Nachuk's um, answer there, I, I was going to say something, but uh, I think Mr. Nachuk covered it uh, adequately. I'm the uh, council rep on the Trails and Greenways Committee, and um, I will concur that that answer was, uh, was fine. Um, just to clarify a little bit with point three and four, because it, it could be confusing is that the current committee at the last meeting ratified that Mr. Nachuk would be the chairperson for the next year and as the city rep he will be the chairperson. Number four gives the, the committee the possibility next year to make a change if they see fit. So there is no contradiction there. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for that one. It'll come forward, I guess, next week. Uh, the next item, I believe Mr. Nochuk, uh you'll be with us on this one as well. It's the citizen appointments for the Whiters Trail and Greenways Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, this uh, report is the appointment of representatives for the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee. So in 2013, Council approved the nominations of eight 
community representatives for the White Horse Trails and Greenways Committee for terms of various lengths. And because it was the very beginning, the inception of this committee, we staggered uh, the termination dates of uh, the various members so that we always had consistency with some uh, members who uh, had a, a, a knowledge and understanding of the operation of the committee. And so each of the, uh, of the terms were staggered. The two-year terms uh, of, of four community uh, representatives uh, expire on October the 31st, 2014. So the terms of reference of the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee states that the membership shall consist of eight community members, representative of trail users, stakeholders, and a balance of motorized and non-motorized users, have a minimum of two community associations represented. All appointments uh, must be made by a resolution of council. So the city advertised uh, uh, for new members in the summer of 2014 and received one nomination and three renominations of existing members. Administration has reviewed each nomination slash renomination and recommends the following four representatives for appointment to fill the community membership vacancies, each for a two-year term expiring October the 31st, 2016. So we have uh, Jeannie B uh, Burke, uh, who is... Uh, uh, being nominated by the Whitehorse Cross Country Ski Club. We have Sierra Vandermeer, uh, who's being nominated by the Contagious Mountain Bike Club, and that's a reappointment. Jeff Maranowski uh, is being nominated by the Porter Creek Community Association, and that is a reappointment. And Bruce Henry, nominated by the Maryland Community Association, which is also a reappointment. I suggest that uh, with three out of the four being reappointments, they must enjoy their, their time on the, uh, on the committee. So the administrative recommendation is that uh, Jeannie Burke be appointed to the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee for a two-year term expiring October 31st, 2016, and that Sierra Vandermeer, Jeff Maranowski, and Bruce Henry be reappointed to the Whitehorse Trails and Greenways Committee for a two-year term expiring October 31st, 2016. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, uh, seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. And uh, the next item on the agenda for this committee is new business. Does anyone wish to raise any new business with this committee? Seeing none, does anyone wish to speak to this committee? Sir, come forward and state your name and your address for the record and uh, <coughs> look forward to your presentation. I believe the our light system works on this uh, as well, so uh, uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Keith Lay. I live at 528 uh, Grove Street in Whitehorse, and I'm here for Active Trails Whitehorse Association. And there are a number of things that I'd like to discuss with regard to the um, terms of reference. Uh, first, if you refer to 11.3, Communication of YTGC Activities. In, section, uh, in this section, number three, it is stated that a summary of the minutes, issues, actions, and recommendations of the YTGC's regular meetings and outcomes of recommendations shall be made available by the chairperson within one week of approval on the city's website. Uh, this is not working very well. As of September the 2nd, the minutes of June 19th and July 17th have not been posted. It is my understanding that these did not appear on the city website until the middle of September. Apparently, the reason for this was that the committee did not have a quorum at uh, both the July, at either the July or the August meeting, and as a result, the draft minutes of, of the June and July meetings could not be approved. Now, uh, <laughs> even if uh, Section 3 was followed, it would, be, it would be up to five weeks between the time of the meeting and the release of approved minutes. This is unacceptable as it puts the public at an extreme disadvantage if issues arise at YTGC meetings with which they may be concerned and to which they may wish to respond. So if something happened in the June meeting, we don't know about it till September. That's a bit ridiculous. Section 11.3 should be changed as follows. A summary of the draft minutes, issues, actions, and recommendations of the YTGC's regular meetings and outcomes of recommendations shall be made available by the chairperson within the week following each committee meeting. So uh, I don't see or we don't see any reason why those draft minutes should not be on the website a week after each of these meetings take place. Then the public knows what's going on. They recognize their draft meetings, draft minutes, and need to be approved, so they can take that into consideration. But at least they have an idea what's going on. We shouldn't have to wait months before we find out what's being discussed at these meetings. Uh, number two, I'd like to bring up 11.1, .1, bringing a trail issue to the committee. At the present time, um, uh, 
if one wants to bring a, a concern to the committee, it has to be submitted at least three weeks prior to the YTGC monthly meeting. Uh, we feel that there's no reason why resident stakeholders or associations that have to submit trail matters concerns to the chair three weeks before a committee meeting. As citizens, as I've just pointed out, have had at times to wait three months before minutes of YTGC meetings are made available on the city website. If an issue arises within those minutes that they wish to bring before the committee, it may be already too late to do so. Adding a three-week notice period to the mix will certainly add to the problem. We suggest that this be reduced to one week. Third thing I'd like to bring up uh, is membership general. Um, number nine in this section has been changed, as, as was pointed out. Instead of holding a meeting once a year, the committee will now meet 10 times per calendar year. Um, as was mentioned, uh, this seems to reflect the fact that in July and August of this year, there were not enough members present to make up a quorum. Now that really concerns me as an individual and a citizen and uh, as a member of ATWA. Uh, this is the most important time of the year when our, our trails are being used at most. Uh, highly likely that uh, trail related issues during the summer months will be greater and yet we can't get uh, members to turn up for meetings and we can't get a quorum. And uh, some of these organizations have very large memberships. Why on earth couldn't they delegate it to someone else to show up at these, these meetings? So. Rather than saying we should simply reduce it to 10 a year, we should be looking at reasons why people are not showing up during the summer months, the most important months of the year as far as trails are concerned. Uh, number 10 in this section says that administrative support will be provided by the city of Whitehorse. Atwa has argued uh, long and loud that uh, the minutes of these meetings should be taken by an independent person. Uh, how can a chairperson make up agendas hold a meeting or, or carry out a meeting and take minutes at the same time. Uh, we would like a, an independent person doing this and the city certainly has the ability to provide uh, such a person. Uh, this would certainly relieve the chairperson of trying to do all these various tasks and would probably result in a better quality of minutes and minutes that were more understandable by the general public. Uh, we've already referred to the uh, concern with, uh, as you know, observers were banned from meetings starting, I guess, in June, July, and August, of course, uh, um, and, and now apparently it's, it's, this is not going to be happening anymore. That uh, Mr. Lee, unfortunately the time has expired. I understand you provided a written I did, yeah. uh, uh, submission, and I believe all of the committee has received copies of that as administration got a copy. So this is very useful information for us, and I, I think we'll be able to use this as we move forward to, uh, uh, to next week when we deliberate on this matter. Um, before you leave, though, if it's okay with you, uh, if, if the committee, if committee members would like to ask you any questions to help clarify, uh, does anybody wish to ask questions? Councillor Stockdale? Well, it was a pattern that we adopted in previous times. If somebody had a long presentation, we always said, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Hmm. Well, one of the things I was, I was just going to bring up was this uh, observers. Uh, uh, as, you, as you know, observers are not allowed to attend meetings, so virtually every meeting was an in-camera session. And if this is going to be, this should be in the terms of reference. If the city and administration can simply say, okay, uh, we're not going to allow uh, observers for these three months, then that should be in the terms of reference, that the city and the administration can do that. Uh, this came out of the blue, and... Uh, it's supposed to be a, a, a committee that's open to the public. And if people can't even go and see what's going on, uh, that's wrong. But if you're going to do it, then have the guts to put it in your terms of reference and say the city can do this when it wants to and the administration can do this when it wants to, so people are aware. Uh, not have it come out of the blue. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Stockdale, one more? Yeah, just it seems to me uh, number 11 under Number 11, um, <laughs> any member of the public may attend the committee's meetings as an observer. Right. And you just said they couldn't attend. Well, we just addressed that. Uh, uh, Mr. Netiot just brought that up. Uh, observers were not allowed to attend, I think it was the June, July, and August uh, meeting and September meeting, and we just heard that it's now going to be opened up again okay. uh, for the October meeting. Oh, okay. 
So right. the public should, <laughs> if you're going to do that, it should be in your terms of reference to give you permission to do that. And it wasn't there, and yet it was done. And um, Right. Okay, thank you. That clarifies it for me anyway. Any other questions for Mr. Lay? Seeing none, thank you very much for your submission. Uh, very helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other, uh, any, anybody else wish to speak to this committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, Your Worship. Uh, thank you. I don't have a question for Mr. Lee. I just have a, um, just a point. Um, not for you, Mr. Lee. No, it's good. It's just more process. We talked a long time ago about not being disrespectful and op offering people an opportunity to talk for an indefinite period of time. Council doesn't have that prerogative, and we don't exercise that prerogative when we have guests in here either. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. I think it's very disrespectful to, do you have anything else? Would you like something else? Nothing, Mr. Lay. I really appreciate his, his presentation. We have a written one, but I think it's disrespectful to this process um, and this, in this uh, council to, to, to offer that opportunity for people to talk for an indefinite period of time, be it a councillor, the mayor, or our guests. So I would really encourage all the council not to, to do that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. I believe this committee is concluded. Uh, Chair, back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Cameron. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon Councillor Stockdale. Would you please take your chair for the Public Health and Safety Committee, please? Certainly, Your Worship. Um, find my place now. Just have one item on my Public Health and Safety Committee. Is there any new business for this committee? Seeing none, does anyone wish to speak to this committee? Hearing no one, that concludes my committee of worship. Thank you, Councillor Stockdale. Next, I'd like to call upon Councillor Irwin. Would you please take your chair for the deputy, I'm sorry, for the Department Services Committee, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. One item of uh, business, and that is new business. Is there any new business to come before this committee? Is there anyone in the gallery? Your Worship, who, or Madam Chair? I am very sorry. Sir Cameron. Just want to put in a little bit of plug. Uh, there's a, a very interesting event happening this week in Whitehorse uh, with Opportunities North uh, Forum taking place. Um, and uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at the big picture of the economy of uh, Whitehorse and the Yukon. And uh, look forward to any, anybody interested in coming forward and taking that in. It, it should be a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other new business? before this committee? Is there anyone in the gallery who wishes to speak to this committee? Seeing no one, I will turn the chair back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Irwin. Next, um, I'm going to have to ask Councillor Irwin to please take Councillor Stryker's uh, chair for the Corporate Services Committee. I do apologize. Uh, uh, Councillor Stryker called me and we tried very hard to have him online. He may be in the United Kingdom right now watching us online, which would be great, in which case, hello, hello, Councillor. We do apologize we weren't able to uh, facilitate your request, so I do apologize. So if I could ask uh, Councillor Irwin to please take your chair, please. Thank you, Your Worship. One item of business, and that is new business. Is there any new business to come before this committee? Seeing none, is there anyone in the gallery who wishes to speak to this committee? Seeing no one, I will turn the chair back to you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Irwin. Uh, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.